Welcome, everybody. This is Santa Rosa Junior College's semi-annual speech and debate night. My name is Nicholas Riley. I am the residential militant free market capitalist of the team. And uh, my name is Ava Persinger. And I spend most of my time being a professional Minecraft player and looking up conspiracy theories on the internet. Now, that being said, we are going to be your hosts for this evening, just as Hal's already explained. Uh, Ava and I, just a little bit of background, we both joined the debate team. Uh, this is our third, yeah, third semester on the speech and debate team. Uh, we're actually debate partners, so we spend a little bit too much time with one another. Um, that being said, uh, we'll just tell you a little bit about kind of the things that we do. I personally, I compete in parliamentary debate, I compete in IPDA debate, and I also compete in impromptu speaking. And uh, as for me, I compete in parliamentary debate, IPDA debate, and uh, competitively making jokes about Nick's mom. Huh? <laughs> so <laughs> that being said, before we really get into the meat of tonight's event, before we start really doing the fun part, we kind of have to do our obligatory thank yous because there's some people that really uh, did a lot of work to make this happen. We want to show we really do appreciate those people. Uh, at the top of our list, obviously, is our three amazing coaches. They were already mentioned, but seriously, you guys do more work than you have credit for. Uh, Hal, Susan, Mark, we love you guys. We really appreciate you. Uh, also, thank you so much to the people that helped set up the lights, helped set up the microphone that I'm holding at an inappropriate distance from my face. Um, <laughs> Really, you guys did a fantastic job, and uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. I know most of you are here because you're getting extra credit, but I really hope you guys have fun. This is how I joined uh, the speech and debate team, actually, by, is by going to one of these. Now, <clears throat> so if you guys see any events tonight, anything goes on that you're really interested in that like looks like a lot of fun, please, I'm begging you. Come find me, come find Ava, come find Hal, come find someone sitting in these first two rows and we will help you out and show you how you can become more involved with this team. Uh, also come if you just like to make fun of people all the time and just, yeah, because that's what I do to Nick. That's the primarily primary purpose of me being there. Uh, but yeah, whether you're one of those people who wants to decipher uh, aspects of what's going on in the world, someone who has a special and unique message or topic they'd like to perform for an audience, or someone who really just likes talking, uh, the speech and debate team has a place for you. Uh, during the speeches, by the way, please turn your cell phone ringers on the highest vo volume possible, make uh, loud, obnoxious calls to your family members, and everyone at the same time simultaneously play Africa by Toto on the loudest volume you can. Kidding. Even if it's a call from the literal president, tell him you can wait to talk about good tanning salons after the show. With all that being said, please welcome our first victim, I mean presenter, and have fun. Now, <clears throat> for our very first event of the night, we are going to be showing you all what is called a pro uh, program oral interpretation, commonly referred to as a POI because it's much simpler. Uh, this event is definitely one of the most interesting that we compete in. That being said, you're about to see the combination of multiple genres into a single presentation, which I personally find extremely impressive because I can barely do one genre when I'm competing. So that being said, everybody please give it up for Sarah Nash. Sarah is actually enjoying her first semester with SRJC's speech and debate team and is a competitor in both program oral interpretation and prose. Sarah is a nursing major here at SRJC, so hopefully she can save us if we accidentally almost die from smoke-induced lung cancer, or GMOs, of course, and perform, uh, perform emergency brain surgery on anyone in the audience who is already bored to death by me talking. Everyone, please join us in welcoming Sarah Nash. Sorry for being sexist, but if you'd like to stare at tits, have we got an app for you. It's called Tit Stare. It's where you take photos of yourself staring at tits. <laughs> Women aren't that warm to it, for obvious reasons. But don't let that stop you, bro. 
Computer science technology has been on a nonstop upward incline since the 1980s. However, this prosperity has not been shared by everyone. According to the National Center for Education, only 18% of computer science undergraduates are women, as compared to 37% in 1985. What the reason for this, and what defines the landscape of the culture today, is the techie revolution. According to the Smithsonian Museum, marketing in the 1990s and early 2000s promoted the idea that computers are for boys. It became the narrative that we told ourselves about the computing revolution, and it created techie culture. According to this culture, women who succeed are demure, sexy, and don't make any fuss about the mistreatment they face. One woman who faced this stereotype was author Virginia Woolf, a writer from the 20th century who directly fought against this idea of a perfect professional woman. The angel in the house, her name for this phantom, is what we must fight in order to move forward, both in the industry and as a society and poetry by Megan Garber, and prose by philanthropist Melinda Gates, Virginia Woolf, and Jason Schreier, we examine women's challenges when existing on a public platform. A program, the angel in the house. Thus, when I came to write, there were very few material obstacles in my way. Writing was a reputable and harmless occupation. The family peace was not broken by the scratching of a pen, no demand was made upon the family purse. The cheapness of writing paper is, of course, the reason why women have succeeded as writers before they have succeeded in the other professions. Be pure. The thought of ruining her career, her being raped and killed, I wonder if all the harassment will drive her to suicide. I wish I were more of a psychopath or a sociopath and I could just completely ignore the fact that there's this guillotine pointed at my neck all the time. But I can't. And I don't think a lot of developers can. And unfortunately, that threat is used a lot. It's used all the time. You who come of a younger and happier generation may not have heard of her. You may not know what I mean by the angel in the house. I will describe her as shortly as I can. She was pure. The angel in the house slipped behind me and whispered, my dear, you are a young woman. Women, women are the perk here. Need another beer? Let another one of our friendly female staff get that for you. Be sympathetic, be tender, flatter, deceive, use all the arts and wiles of our sex. Never let anybody guess that you have a mind of your own above all. Be pure. Booth babes, so many babes, everywhere. The angel made as if to guide my pen. I now record the one act for which I will take some credit to myself, though the credit rightfully belongs with some excellent ancestors of mine who left me behind a certain sum of money so that it was not necessary for me to depend solely on charm for my living. I turned upon her and caught her by the throat. Be pure. The breast is the most titillating fun you can have. Get it? <laughs> Here are some women in bikinis leaping. Get it? Big boobs, dongles, big dongles, balls, forking. Be pure. I did my best to kill her. My excuse, if I were to be had up in the court of law, would be that I acted in self-defense. Had I not killed her, she would have killed me. Gangbang interviews are a bad idea. Just FYI. Just attract the chicks and scare the dicks. That's what it's all about, bro. Be pure. She would have plucked the heart out of my writing. <clears throat> Sexism in tech is as old as, well, tech. We tried to have more women on our panels, on our stages, but we failed. There just weren't any who were qualified. Be pure. I want to let you know that even in a dream job, there are some bad days as well as good ones. Although I loved it, there was a brief time when I considered quitting. I was worried that the people that I saw in managing roles, all men by the way, had a much different leadership style than I did. 
more aggressive, less collaborative. I thought that in order to succeed, I'd need to act more like them. But when I tried it, I hated it. So the next time you women want to start pointing the finger at me when discussing the problem of too few women in tech, just stop, ladies, with your blame. Look in the mirror instead. The kids these days would call it a sausage fest. Grit is this quality that a lot of successful people have. And it's this ability to push forward with something, anything worth doing. And it's not necessarily day-to-day -day fun sometimes. Sometimes it is. Great when it is. But grit usually means that somebody sees the long-term goal. And they see the long-term vision. And they push forward on any problems that they have on a day-to-day -day basis with the end in mind. When we selected Rebecca and she said yes, she was a sexy single woman. And since that time, she's become a sexy married woman. If you ever find yourself feeling out of place, I want to let you know that the last thing tech needs is more people who look and think the same. Innovation requires new insights and new perspectives, and that is exactly what you have to offer. We merged technology and humanity. Get it? Remember that with this degree, you have earned your place in this industry. No one belongs here more than you do. So it's important to stay true to what makes you, you. Connection. She sacrificed herself daily. It would be best for us to kill ourselves on this rather than fail. The thing we sacrificed for this was ourselves. Revolution. She never had a mind or a wish of her own. She was pure. Anyway. Sorry if we offended some of you. Very unintentional. Just a fun Aussie hack. We're 99% done, but the last 1%'s a bitch. <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> Outwardly, what is simpler than to write books? Just a joke. Outwardly, what obstacles are there for a woman rather than for a man? Just a joke. Inwardly, I think the case is very different. She has many ghosts still to fight, many challenges to overcome killing the angel in the house. Just a joke. She died. Just a joke. Killing the angel in the house. She died. Just let it happen. It'll all be over soon. You, uh, so I'd first like to say that uh, that's the first POI I've heard with the opening being boobs. And I'd just like to say, that was, that was epic. <laughs> no, really, Sarah, that was absolutely fantastic. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, next, we're going to be showing you a prose performance. Prose is an individual event in which competitors perform literature, typically in the form of a short story or an excerpt from a novel. Um, I actually... I once saw a prose performance in competition where the competitor performed uh, Ro Romeo and Juliet, uh, both parts, actually, both Romeo and Juliet, and um, they failed. Uh, they lost uh, by a lot. But the, the, the only thing that I might add is that they did walk away from that with a different ending. Uh, not so much better, but they did survive. So that was the good part. Marissa is in her first semester at SRJC uh, speech and debate team and has enjoyed significant competitive success in individual events, including winning second place in prose at San Francisco State University's Golden Gate Opener Tournament and third place at University of the Pacific's Paul Winters Invitational. Aside from being on the forensics team, Marissa is also a competitor on SRJC's cross-country team, which just returned from states and recently won conference for the first time since 1979. Yeah, cross-country team. I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> I mean, our debate team won nationals last year, but uh, no one cares about that because we're nerds. <laughs> Everyone, please welcome Marissa. Amy. 
man, where do you learn to fight like that? People used to ask. My brothers, I'd say. They were rascals, always wrestling each other. I was the youngest, victim to the cruelest of their whims. Like that time they gave me that strip of bacon and told me to go feed Howler. I wanted to say no, but my dad wasn't home. Howler was kept outside in a cage made of two by fours and chicken wire. I stuck my hand in and he lunged. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence recently reported that over a quarter of people have been physically abused in their lifetime. Social learning theory developed by Albert Bandura informs us that people learn behaviors from those around them. The National Domestic Violence Hotline recently applied this to relationships, arguing that domestic abuse is a learned behavior used to gain and maintain power over others. It can occur in many forms, including intimidation, economic abuse, animal cruelty, and more. Such is the case in the short story, Dog Fights, by Wentley Dickinson. My mom came home and saw the gashes on my hand and poured hydrogen peroxide on it. It fizzed, and I thought it would burn my skin off. But I didn't say anything, because my dad had just gotten home. What the hell happened? How I got him, I told you, you can't just cage him up and expect. We need the money. We need the money. He slapped her, and I looked away. She asked me later how my hand was feeling, and I said, much better. The fights were terrible. Animals sound grating against my ears like metal on metal. They held the events in my father's warehouse because we lived out in the country, far away from people and any major roads. The first time Howler came back, I thought maybe his eye had been popped open. It was covered in blood, and I couldn't look. Don't worry, K-9 just snagged his eyelid, he'll be okay. It went on like this. I realized Howler wasn't a pet, and my brothers didn't give me any more bacon scraps. The last time, Howler didn't come back. I came home from school and my mom had bruises all over her face and I wondered if maybe she had jumped in the ring to try and save Howler, even though I knew she hated him. I had nightmares. I'm walking through the trees near the back of the warehouse. I stumble over on something. Howler, half buried in dirt, has my hand in his teeth and there's murder in his eyes. Sometimes the dream changes and I am Howler, being crushed by the weight of the soil, whimpering as I watch myself walk by in the night. So I fight like a dog. Everyone at school has beef with me. I take no shit. I have no skill, no finesse, just relentlessness. That's how I do it. Hey Amen. where'd you learn to fight like that? My brothers make me watch the dog fights when they think my dad isn't looking. I learned it from my brothers. It's a point of pride. I swagger down the street, hearing it like a chorus in my head. Where did you learn to fight like that? And my dad's voice too saying, dogs are stupid as They don't know how to fake, how to use their opponent's weight against them. They only know brute strength and pain and not wanting to die. I grow up and move away. My dad never calls. I box on the side for the thrill, for the respect, so that the chorus just keeps on going. Where'd you learn to fight like that? I think less and less 
of the shallow grave of bones being bleached by the sun. Howler and his enemies mixed up, one rib indistinguishable from another. The first time I hit her, it was a mistake. I'm just a kid for cross sake, give me a break. I'm sorry, all right. It's not gonna happen again. She wants a pet and I get some fish because I've sworn off dogs. I'm not that kind of man. They swim around in circles, their eyes without lids, unblinkingly staring back at me. When things get bad, I put a box of cereal in front of their bowl, hiding their scaly bodies from sight. There is a second time. It's not that bad, really, I tell myself. I tell her, black eyes heal quickly enough. I have seen dogs with their flanks torn open, another dog still ripping away at it, even though it's clearly already dead. I will save it for someone who cares, she says. I almost slap her. There is a third, a fourth, however many times. I don't keep track. The last time, she is on the kitchen floor. And she is not moving. I put her in my car and make my way to the hospital. It's a strange drive. She breathes unevenly in the back seat. I am directionless. I want to cry, but can't. Where did you learn to fight like that? That night, the dream I haven't had in years comes back. In this mutation, I am my father, throwing howl in the ring, his teeth bared, and everyone making bets and roaring at every lunge, nip, and gouge. I collect my money and take him back when it's over. I patch him up, let him rest. Next week, I'll throw him back into the ring again. But he doesn't recover. He couldn't be patched back together again. And his body is cool to the touch within hours. Dogs are stupid as shit. So I take him to the pit around back and throw him in. As I turn to leave, I see that Howler has turned into my wife. Her hand grips me as she pulls me to the shallow grave I have built for her. She knows that I could not patch her back together again. And she is asking me, where did you learn cruelty like that? So everyone just kind of catch your breath for a second. That was pretty intense. Uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. That was absolutely excellent. You'll, you'll find very few competitors that can uh, move a crowd quite like that. Um, that's something we're very proud of, her performances and in, in competition on this team. Well, now that we got that really heavy segment out of the way, let's lighten the mood a little bit. In just a moment, you are all going to have the opportunity to witness a parliamentary debate, or as every competitor on this team likes to call it, uh, everyone in the circuit likes to call it, parley. Parliamentary debate is a form of debate in which, 
in which a resolution will be read and two teams will have a maximum of 20 minutes to try to make themselves absolute experts on that resolution. Excuse me, 20 minutes to prepare and get to their debate room, which may be half a mile away. Now, the affirmative team uh, will be affirming the, re the resolution. They'll be arguing in favor of it, while the negative team is going to be rejecting the resolution. So normally these debaters would have, as I said, 20 minutes to prepare all of their arguments. Um, and they're often on incredibly complex issues, usually ranging anywhere from economic policy making, international diplomacy, uh, to sometimes even philosophical questions like what is the meaning of life or why the hell did I actually join the debate team because this is terrifying. Um, now to spare all of you the enjoyment of watching our four debaters sit in absolute silence for 20 minutes, uh, we've actually had them already prep their cases. They're ready to go, they're ready to argue for us. Uh, they're gonna show us exactly what they got. Now, usually debaters are speaking incredibly fast about resolutions um, and trying to convince you why it is that if you buy just one Toyota Prius, somehow you've solved for climate change. Um, now, for the sake of time and understanding, uh, we've actually changed the traditional speaking times. Uh, they've been altered a little bit, so this isn't exactly as long as a regular debate would be in competition. Um, in addition to that, we've asked that our debaters all make sure they avoid any jargon, any unnecessary terms, uh, so that everybody in the audience is going to be able to understand. Can you please put your phone down? Holy crap! Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. Tonight's resolution will be... Nick wants people to not have phones and be isolated from the rest of the world. I mean, smartphones do more harm than good. With that, allow us to introduce our debaters. So yes, from the affirmative team arguing in favor of the resolution that smartphones have in fact done more harm than good, we have first, the younger embodiment manifestation of our Secretary of State, James Mattis. Nick, no one knows who that is. Commonly referred to as Joseph Anderson and his partner, the only member of this team that I would be afraid to fist fight, Sophie Haugen. Who really wanted you guys to know that she is a vegan, by the way. From the negative team, we have Cameron Stymack and Brian Burroughs who are definitely human and not AIs we program to memorize this debate. So don't mention anything about that to anyone, please. No, just one They made a final... rare, um, <laughs> sorry. They made a rare entrance to this room today from their mom's basement, which is usually where they are most of the time. Just one, one quick final thing, and this is more for our debaters than it is for the audience. Uh, we observe three very, very important rules in parliamentary debate, and they are the exact same rules as ancient Greek wrestling. Those three rules, number one, no eye gouging. Number two, no ear biting. Number three, no shots below the belt. Now, please be civil. Uh, this is for the audience's enjoyment, and we want to actually impress them and show them why it is we won nationals for this last year. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be using this handy-dandy watch device uh, to time myself because smartphones suck. Uh, the resolution, just to reiterate, is smartphones do more harm than good. We're going to quickly define that is, oh, start time, uh, is that smartphone is not a dumb phone. It is a phone that can download apps, has access to the internet, and has like a touch screen if I were having one like that. Um, the weighing mechanism that we're going to use is net benefits, which means that this is net beneficial, that the world, they're going to be arguing that the world is better with smartphones, we will be arguing that the world is better without smartphones. This debate is a debate about what we value, i.e. what we call it a value debate, um, and we have two contentions we're going to be making. Smartphones are harmful through their production, and smartphones are har harmful th to those who use them. Woo, if I can get words out. Uh, so the harms of production we're just going to go into quickly is that first it destroys the environment. Um, so lithium cobalt and rare earth minerals are needed to create these phones and the extraction of these minerals creates awful runoff, especially when it comes to the lithium. Lithium creates runoff that kills flamingos in Argentina and Bolivia. So, you know, if you like flamingos, you're going to be 
throwing out that smartphone. Um, and children mine for cobalt in the Congo. About 20% of all cobalt comes from these mines um, and are mined by hand. Some people call them artisanal uh, mining, but it's actually just using ch children to uh, mine this by hand, and they don't get paid, so it's artisanal slavery. Um, so with these human rights abuses that happen, uh, no smartphones. The second part is going further into human rights abuses that happen with smartphones is that uh, in 2010, Foxconn, which makes most of the iPhone, iPhones, um, which it, it, that's the main Chinese manufacturing brand that creates many of these, there were about 18 reported suicide attempts by workers and about 14 confirmed deaths. And uh, also Foxconn, in 2011, many of the workers suffered an, an electric shock that left some of them brain damaged. Uh, there wasn't any compensation for that. Uh, and another... And with the China Labor Watch reported that workers manufacturing these smartphones at all Apple factories working far past 60 hours a week uh, without compensation for the extra time. So we see in this situation that there are, again, large human rights abuses that happen in the production solely of smartphones. Um, and it would take about four months for a factory worker to afford a Google Pixel 2, five to afford a Samsung Galaxy S8, and six months to afford an Apple X, uh, working 60 hours a week. Again, smartphones, the huge labor, labor cost for this makes them unethical. Um, smartphones would make, uh, so going into the second part of this is that harmful in production because they make a huge amount of electronic waste. Um, in 2000, in 2016, about 43 million tons of electronic waste was produced, and this is going up from 2014. Um, so this is the fastest form, gr fastest gr form of refuse. Blah, words, yeah. Um, so this, we just see that there is a large consumer need for this, and when we have more and more people wanting to consume these phones, we have larger amounts of uh, consumer waste being mated, made, mated, woo. Um, so this kind of contributes to this consumer culture where we have more and more people wanting things at a higher and faster rate, uh, which just makes every situation uh, much worse, especially with human rights abuses that happen in these situations. And we have like, you know, those old Nokia phones. Well, about all of the, the waste is enough to make nine uh, pyramids of Giza, which would be the only good use for those Nokia phones, um, considering the fact that they're indestructible. Uh, so the second part is the harms to the users who use these phones. Uh, about 77% of Amer Americans own a smartphone, and a typical person goes, picks up their phone 110 times in the day. Most of you have probably, probably picked up your phone while I'm speaking. Thanks. And I'm sure that that's a lot more interesting than me speaking words. Um, but this is about nine times hourly, and the first thing that people, 61% of people do in the morning is check their phone. And we have about uh, one in five 18 to 34 year olds have used their phone during sex. That's a different kind of being turned on. Um, <laughs> so more people have access to smartphones than they do toilets, which shows in this uh, consumer culture, we have a higher you know, need for, or pretend need for phones than we do actually you know, sanitation. Um, so when we have people focusing on this as opposed to, you know, sanitation, food, human rights, then we just make this perpetual culture much worse. Uh, when we have people who are always on their phones being phone addicted, then we have um, this just being perpetuated. Uh, about eight, 15 to 24 year olds spend about four hours online every day. And the number of advertisements that we would see in each day in 1970 was about 500, but now that that number is much closer to 5,000 to 10,000. And if you think about how much time you spend, it doesn't actually seem that unreasonable. Um, so when we have being constantly marketed to, then this just makes this consumer culture so much worse, i.e. making the human rights ab abuses worse and making the incredible waste happening at a higher rate. Um, we don't have any privacy from the companies that uh, have social media, and just going into this again, 
uh, 89% of the time spent on online on a smartphone is on social media apps. So we're just being constantly marketed to. We're making all of these problems much worse by always being connected. And uh, we're connected to the internet. And we no longer have any privacy from the companies that look to market towards us. Uh, so with all of that evidence, it's easy to see that smartphones do much more harm than good. No, you guys don't get to speak. All right, so in your first speech, uh, you said that, uh, or your first uh, contention that is, you said that children are mining and stuff. Do you want to like take away their jobs? You just hate children? Yes. I believe that children should not have jobs. I think that children should not be contributing economically. I All think right. they should be children. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, furthermore, um, uh, s uh, another contention you made in regards to the fact that we are constantly being bombarded with ads. Um, don't you think that there are, al are alternatives to this, such as things like ad block? Uh, ad block is not largely marketed to people. It's something that would just help to the help move the. Uh, bad, bad. That's my answer. For sure. All right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, dang it, you're out of time. <laughs> All right, I think this is close enough. Yeah, sounds like it. If I'm, if I'm eating the, the mic at any point, just yell at me. All right, All right. Uh, seven minutes timed on my smartphone. Starting now. You just, heard, you just heard seven minutes of argument as to why the affirmative believes that smartphones are a greater harm to society than they are a benefit. We on the NEG disagree, and we hope to convince you as to why smartphones are as beneficial as they are harm, harmful, if not more so. The first point, independent point we would like to bring up of the affirmative's case is that we believe that smartphones make us smarter. An obvious first point to this is, of course, that Access to information makes us more capable and expands our knowledge. That's why we go to school for a god-awful amount of time. Um, the second point is that smartphones are a vital point of access to the internet, which is the largest collection of human knowledge that exists. 60% um, of internet traffic exists from uh, mobile devices, and mobile devices are the only point of access uh, for a lot of people in developing nations. For example, in India, mobile devices are uh, the only point of access for 70 point of India's uh, internet users. Smartphones, uh, because of this, we can conclude that smartphones have the poten potential to make us more knowledgeable and more capable as, as individuals. The second independent point we would like to bring up is that smartphones are a tool for fighting oppression. Uh, recording and reporting uh, injustices are critical to raising awareness and pushing back against inequalities that exist in our society. Um, and uh, on our smartphones, most smartphones, I'm pretty sure all of them at this point, uh, come equipped with uh, photo taking uh, cameras for both uh, taking photos and recording video, and your ability to record video with your phone isn't just limited to being able to upload six seconds videos onto the internet, rest in peace, fine. They also allow you to um, record, record instances of injustice be, uh, uh, being committed. Um, for example, in the event such as uh, government corruption happening, or uh, police brutality, or a crime, or just some really weird person being super racist, um, you can take video of this and use it later as evidence to make sure that these problems uh, come to light and are uh, responded to appropriately. Um, uh, furthermore, social media is also a key uh, 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 opportunity for organizing activists for things uh, such as lawful protests and other uh, methods of uh, ensuring um, we, we are currently uh, always fighting for, for uh, better rights for everyone and uh, have a better uh, ability to fight for those rights. 
And of course, looking at all this, and smartphones provide us with the opportunity to do all these things, we have to conclude that it, smartphones provide us with ways to fight back against inequality and injustice. Uh, moving on to uh, the arguments pre presented by the affirmative today, um, they first talked a lot about uh, uh, worker conditions, not only in cases of uh, slavery and even child slavery, but also in what amounts to foreign sweatshops. Uh, the negation uh, asserts that this is not a necessity in the manufacturing of smartphones. Apple and Samsung and all these uh, uh, smartphone companies are some of the richest companies in existence. They can afford to outsource to companies that don't employ slaves. Employ slaves. Um, uh, what we need is our better labor laws, not worse tech. Getting rid of smartphones doesn't s stop uh, these labor, vi labor law violations from occurring. And in fact, we believe that sm smartphones check back against things like sweatshops because they give us an opportunity for activists to film and document uh, uh, cases of these ver very injustices happening, not just in uh, the manufacturing of uh, smartphones, but in other industries such as the shoe retail industry, the clothing industry, even chocolate. Like, come on, chocolate guys? Um, Recording video, video of terrible work, recording video of terrible working conditions raises awareness about these issues in the same way that I outlined uh, just previously. Um, they also talk a lot about uh, how smartphones contribute to electronic waste. We also believe that smartphone waste is also a totally solvable problem. Uh, recycling smartphones is, to and is totally possible, not and not just in the way that Apple does it, where every iPhone is basically the same thing as the last one. We can actually put f uh, steps forward to making sure that uh, we are recycling iPhones and making sure that uh, we are not wasting valuable materials such as lithium and cobalt that they outlined. Um, On to their uh, s uh, second group of contentions, which is about how smart they believe smartphones are harmful to uh, the users. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go for the really easy one, that one five people use uh, smartphones during sex. Smartphones get you laid, guys. Come on. <laughs> this is a pro. Um, uh, they talk a lot about how ads are uh, constantly being marketed to us and that this is like pers and that smartphones are a major source of this. But um, there are lots of ways that you as an individual can just completely avoid this. Adblock, as I mentioned during cross-examination, is one very easy way of avoiding, uh, avoiding ads. Um, um, and if they, they contend that it's very difficult, to, like no one knows about Adblock, I'm pretty sure most people in the audience know about Adblock. If you know about Adblock, you probably are nodding your head right now. Um, and so, and if these alternatives are too much of a hassle, then I suspect the ads that they say are so bad aren't th really that bad to begin with if we can't even be bothered to like download the little app for, for ad block that takes five minutes. Um, they also talk about the fact that social media is designed to be addictive, but if you, aren't, if you don't believe that uh, ads are a threat or that you, we don't have a way of avoiding ads, then social media being addicting is in a harm on its own. That's true of basically every other en entertainment industry. No one wants to make Marvel movies boring. They want you to keep coming to every single one. Every single one. And so when we look at the fact that it's addictive by design, that's not necessarily a bad thing on its own unless the way it's addictive is actively harming people and we've proven that it's not. Um, and uh, to summarize, since I have 15 seconds, um, most of the problems that we are seeing uh, brought forth by the affirmative are problems that we can fix or are temporary problems. Uh, whereas the benefits that we have uh, talked about are long lasting so long as we continue to value these uh, smartphones. Thank you very much. Oh, so we don't care about flamingos. That's a thing. Can't get away so easy. Yeah. So, does the negation offer any plan to put recycling and labor laws in place? No, we don't think we have to do that, just the same as the affirmative isn't. So it's no? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you're arguing for the status quo? For I guess. For things as they are? I guess. <laughs> when you're talking about 
uh, learning things from the internet. If you have Wikipedia there, why would you bother actually learning anything if you can always just go look it up? Doesn't looking up involve learning about the thing? How many Wikipedia articles do you remember? Do you want the whole list? <laughs> You, this, I know what you're going for, but this is the wrong person to be asking it. I spend way, way too much time on Wikipedia. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be going through their arguments in order and then going through our arguments in the same order that they were presented. So, the, so the, the first point that they were making was that smartphones provide you with constant access to information. If you have constant access to information, you're not going to bother actually learning any of the information. You're just going to go look it up whenever it becomes relevant. This, this is a, a fundamental problem with having constant access to different types of technology. Like, how many people actually remember how to do long division? You have a calculator for that. Why would you ever use long division? It's basically pointless now. So by having a smartphone giving you a constant source of information, it's basically doing the same thing. It's removing any need for you to ever actually learn anything. You just have all the information you'd ever need. Um, also, they talk a lot about how this is providing uh, crazy amounts of access to all sorts of people all over the world. Well, the internet isn't really the most trustworthy source of news all the time. In fact, that's where basically all the fake news is. So if you think, well, basically, there's more problems with getting all of your news from the internet than there is from getting all of your news from any other source. So really we should be discouraging people from just limiting their source of information to this relatively small area. Um, their other point is that by being able to film corruption or pr police brutality, you can uh, or you can bring light to these issues that uh, our society has. And we would say those solutions could also be from journalists, or you could have body cams for police, and then you achieve the same results, and you don't have people addicted to social media, you don't have all of the problems that exist with smartphones. And there are plenty of other ways to organize activists beyond just using a little buzzing thing that's in your pocket that you, you could quite easily, I don't know, use a telephone or something like that, something that has worked for quite a long time. Moving on to our points about production. Um, so they say that it's not necessary that these problems with the production cycle exist with smartphones, but it's a, our argument is basically that they do exist right now, so we should be concerned about them. And we should actually consider whether we should be buying new smartphones uh, because of these issues with the production cycles. Um, so, even, so, another one of the things that they mentioned was that there are a lot of other things that contribute to, that have these labor issues, and sure, there are other industries that have problems, but th smartphones are one of the major contributors because they're, kind of the, it's one of the major driving industrial processes of the modern age. Uh, they talk about how 
this could, we could only learn about this through using smartphones. Smartphones have a lot of fake news. We would be better off just looking at newspapers or using any other older form of news communication in order to get that information. And specifically, the workers who this is affecting can't actually afford the phones, so there's it's not actually helping them. They can't get additional information from something that they have no way to afford. Um, and then they talk about recycling, but really, if a big corporation can do something the cheap way or the expensive way, they're going to choose the cheap way every time. It's just a question of economics. That's, that's, just, ca that's just how capitalism works. That's not particularly specific to this. Um, I'll, I'll touch on using smartphones during sex. They, if you're using a smartphone during sex, it must not be very good. Like, you just, there's just, there's no way. Uh, um, uh, okay, and then moving on. The, the main thing that they were saying about ad block, like, using ad block on your phone is really hard. Most people don't have the programming background in order to install it on your phone. It's not specifically easy to install on a computer. Like, that's just something that we have a distorted picture of because we live right next to the San Francisco, which is kind of the tech capital of the world. We just have a distorted picture of that. It's actually not very common at all that people use it. Um, and then, They're, they're saying that social media is kind of like any other form of media. That it's like if you if you were to go watch the the news on TV or something, it's going to have the same effect of not really improving your life at all. But you don't carry your TV around with you all the time, and that's the main thing that we're saying is the problem with smartphones is that you have this little glass brick that you carry around with you, and it makes buzzing noises at you, and you're addicted to those buzzing noises, and in fact, anyone who has the buzzing noises is probably going to pull out their phone and look at it right away, even if we told them not to. Um, so, yeah, there's basically a whole bunch of issues with smartphones, and you should be trying to avoid them. Thank you. So, um, first thing you said on your, uh, in regards to what we said about uh, smartphones being used to uh, organize activists. You said there are alternatives such as te telephones. Do you mean those like the glass block boxes that they took out everywhere that don't exist because smartphones made them kind of irrelevant? I was referring specifically to the rotary dial ones that have the separate headpiece and uh, mouthpiece. Gotcha. <laughs> or telegraphs work too. Or telegraphs. Telegraphs sure. are also excellent. Smoke signals, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Ooh, I made that joke. All right. Uh, so really quick, I'm going to be going over once again our arguments, explain to you why they are right and why um, my opponents are wrong. Okay. So let's start my time now. Uh, so first off, on our point that smartphones make us smarter. Basically, what they said is that there's like a lot of fake news and we're addicted to social media, so this doesn't matter. But in fact, like. If people are addicted to their phones, they're addicted to one of the largest like wealth of information that we've ever had as humans. So they're basically addicted to the library. Like, where's the harm in that? Tell me, tell me that. Um, I, I think my parents wish I was addicted to the library. Um, okay. Uh, so you know, we also um, they, they never um, actually addressed the point that we made that people in developing countries their only access to the internet is through their mobile phones. So so well maybe like. They are, you know, they're, they're rich. They can, um, they can go to libraries and stuff. They can, they have their laptops, their fancy MacBooks, right? Well, people in developing countries, their only access to a lot of information about like what's happening in the world, is through their phone. Uh, so without that, like they'd be at a huge disadvantage here. Um, so we need to think about these people when we uh, take into consideration this debate. Um, 
so then also, so, so now on to um, our point on how it's a tool to fight oppression. Uh, so um, this is a big one. They, they talked about how like, you know, police could like wear body cameras and, and something like that. Um, but like, who are we gonna trust here? Like the police or like a ton of people with phones that can like record events as they're happening. And we're not just talking about like police violence. Like we, uh, people can film uh, events of like domestic brutality. Uh, they can um, film all sorts of crimes. Like this is not just uh, talking about like police violence here. So um, just having a phone on you all the time is a huge benefit uh, to the user. Um, let's see, yeah, and um, let's go on to their case. Uh, so, so the first thing that they talked about is basically how uh, there's uh, a lot of harms to creating smartphones. Um, one thing that they said that uh, no one really has mentioned uh, after uh, they brought it out in their first speech uh, was how creating batteries kills flamingos. Um, I'm sorry, but flamingos are just tacky lawn ornaments. <laughs> Get out of here, flamingos. I, no. Okay, like, we're, we're better off without flamingos anyways. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so, point for us, I guess. All right, um, <laughs> so, um, so also, um, they talked about, like, uh, children in, in mines and, yeah, you know, maybe I joked about, like, taking away child, children's jobs, but uh, in reality, like, do they think that, like, child labor didn't exist before smartphones? Um, newsflash, it did. So, yeah, that problem isn't going to go away if we just get rid of smartphones. We need better legislation on, like, preventing this from happening. We don't need to, like, get rid of smartphones. Um, they, they talked about, like, human rights abuses. Once again, this is not unique to smartphones. So, um, and, and this is a solvable problem that we should, in fact, solve. We agree that this is a problem, but it's not unique to smartphones. Um, they also talked about how, like, workers couldn't afford phones. But as uh, my partner stated in the first speech, there are, like, like 70, something like 70% of uh, the population of India ha uh, has access to the internet through mobile phones. And like they wouldn't have that without like cheap phones. So um, maybe they're not like buying like the newest iPhone, but they're buying like a cheap phone that gets them access to like a ton of information. And that's really nice, that's really useful. Um, and then finally, they also talked about like waste and consumer culture and how um, we could build like nine Giza pyramids out of uh, used phones. Um, well, cool, let's do that. I think that would be a real hit. I would go visit that, and maybe we can make money to like protect the environment or something. I think it's a great idea. I'll go in with these guys on it, because I think that's a, that's a genius idea there. Uh, so now, finally, uh, we address the user harms. Um, they talk about how people pick up their phones 110 times a day. And guess why? They're so useful. There are so many things on, the, on your smartphone. Like, why would you not pick it up 110 times a day? Um, <laughs> Like, please, um, th like, but um, being real here, uh, also, like, some people may be, like, addicted to social media. That, that might be a problem. You can get social media from, like, other platforms, like, like laptops, and, like, any computing device that accesses the Internet. Um, but a lot of people don't have access to these other computing devices. They only have access to, like, a cheap smartphone. And uh, these are, once again, in, like, third world countries. Uh, and this gives a huge amount of people access to a ton of information, which is super useful. Uh, and then they also talked about ads. And so I have a real problem with this one. Uh, they talked about, like, how now it's, like, like, ads are targeted towards the user. And this is, like, somehow bad. Okay, so I don't know if you guys remember ads before, like, smartphones, but they were not very good. Like, it would just be, like, a McDonald's ad once in a while, maybe the Geico ad. We all get it by now. 15 minutes saves you 15% or more on your car insurance. But, you know, nowadays, I get great ads. You know, the other day, I don't know if you guys have been getting them, but it's like the Facebook portal, right? So now Facebook, a company known for its security and privacy, is putting this device in your kitchen where it has a camera. It watches you. It's basically like Skype, but, like, always there. So, so now, now you can see Grandma every day. Well, keeping her at a safe distance away, tucked away in Florida, right? Now she's not near you. So, and now, unlike in real life, once grandma starts getting nosy and critiquing your life decisions, it's legal to just pull the plug. All right. Uh, so, so there's my time, guys. But as you can clearly see, 
Smartphones do a lot more good than harm. I think I need a sip of water after how salty that was, Brian. <laughs> um, whoo. Oh man, I, I don't even know where to start. So, other than proving to us that you're wildly addicted to the ads that Facebook puts out, uh, yeah, <laughs> good job. You, you uh, really showed us that. Why do you want to give up all of your privacy to Facebook? Do you really like Zuckerberg that much? He's he's a nice guy. You know he's what? A nice guy, yeah. He makes some good. You're doing products. a really good job proving you're not an AI bot. Like I him. am not an AI bot. <laughs> Promise? Um, <laughs> no. I swear. All right. Where's my time? Hey guys, I'm back. Uh, we're, we're doing summary speeches right now, so these are gonna be much shorter, just wrapping things up in a nice bow. All right, All right let's begin. Uh, so to summarize, while there are absolutely costs to having smartphones, I think we've, that the negation here has demonstrated that these costs can be fixed without having to give up the benefits that we have definitely proven that smartphones incur. Uh, and that these benefits outweigh in the long term. Uh, those benefits, just to recap, are that smartphones uh, give not just us, but the entire world, especially the developing world, a huge uh, amount of access to uh, a lot of information that they very well uh, couldn't get otherwise. And uh, also how smartphones are a great tool for organizing and uh, getting out messages so that uh, we are able to uh, go to bat for the things that we believe in more effectively and stop injustices more effectively. To, to, to look at the costs, uh, in, uh, on the other hand, uh, the harms that the affirmative has brought have uh, one major commonality in that most of them are problems that we don't necessarily solve if we get rid of smartphones and that we, if we put the effort in, can fix without having to get rid of the benefits that smartphones entail. So, uh, um, it, well, except for the flamingo thing, if, if that's a deal breaker for you, I'm sorry. Uh, so in, in conclusion, uh, smartphones are a net benefit to society uh, because they grant us a uh, greater access to knowledge and greater ability to fight injustice. And uh, just b before, before I go, even if you disagree with us after all this and still think that smartphones are a uh, greater harm to society than a good, I still really hope you don't throw away your smartphone uh, because I would hate to uh, contribute to the problem of electronic waste we're uh, uh, having right now. Thank you. This debate comes down to hmm, this debate comes down to one magnificent beast, the flamingo. And I'd just like to say that the neg completely gave up this entire debate when they said they wanted flamingos to die. Um, we believe that these beasts should be kept in the wild and in their habitat, and also that, you know, child slavery is bad. Um, so if you think that the flamingos should w live, uh, we win. Um, but, you know, if you don't just believe that flamingos are great, wonderful creatures, then let me give you some other reasons why we absolutely pulverized um, Brian and Cameron tonight. Um, so the first part that i just like to bring up is kind of going over their case 
so I have a chance to respond to it, is they talk about how it has this incredible wealth of information, an incredible wealth of faulty, uh, lying, fake newsy sort of information. You don't get as much vetting as my partner brought up in things like, I don't know, newspapers, books, things that you can read and touch. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember what this is. It's called paper. Um, but you have like a, the same wealth of information that's vetted through uses of newspaper, et cetera. And as much as Brian wants an omniscient grandma, um, I frankly think that's a little creepy. And the amount of unprecedented, uh, the unprecedented amount of access that we give companies through uh, kind of just going into our case, the unprecedented, unprecedented woo, amount of access that we give companies through our usage of social media, the 110 times a day that we pick up our phone, um, that we should sort of be able to check back for this, that we should distance ourselves from these constant ringy dingy things and actually begin to, you know, de develop meaningful relationships so you don't need to check your phone during times. Um, and just be able to really connect with people, maybe actually see your grandma, Brian. Um, I'm sure she, she's a very nice lady. Uh, and not be able to be constantly monitor monitors by these you know, tech companies that just want to exploit you to buy more phones, to create more waste, to just further this cycle of people not being paid fair wages because you need to be able to make the best phone, po best phone possible that is the most addicting, that you will buy more phones and just contribute to these Wait, contribute to this waste. And I urge you all to throw out your phones so that you can help Brian with his Pyramid of Giza that he's going to create out of old Nokia cell phones or whatever kind of device that you have. Um, and just, we urge you guys to stop the artisanal slavery, to save the flamingos, and to stop the destructive cycle that putting us in this consumer mindset uh, continues. Thank you. Can I just say, we really, truly do live in a society. Now, <laughs> so something, something that I think is really worth, uh, really worth pointing out and something that everybody should know is that all four of these debaters that you just watched, uh, every single one of them is either in their very first semester or one of them, yeah, one of them I believe is in their second semester uh, debating for us. This is all skills that they've somehow miraculously learned in just like a matter of weeks, which absolutely blows my mind because I was awful at that stage. Um, so really, just like hats off to these guys. Just one more round of applause. These guys are amazing. As a longtime standing member of anti-flamingo gang, I, I can say that uh, if you agree that smartphones are going to destroy the earth and that they're harmful to humanity, I'll just, I'll just send someone to collect all of your phones for that uh, pyramid, you know? Just like go around the audience and collect all of your phones to build the pyramid of smartphones because I think that sounds like a good plan. Uh, who wants to revert us back to the Stone Age? I know Nick does because he's uh, anti-phone. Now, if you happen to be like Ava and an anti-social zombie who refuses to do anything other than take Snapchats of yourself vaping in public... <clears throat> I personally would prefer if we didn't. Nick, why you gotta expose me like that? <laughs> anyway, for our next event of the night, we will be showing an example of persuasive speaking. This event is exactly what it sounds like. A competitor will deliver a speech with the intent to persuade the audience to come to a conclusion. This is typically done by a competitor presenting the audience with a problem, building evidence for the cause of a problem, and then presenting the audience with a conclusion to that problem. Competitors will only have a maximum of 10 minutes to make their case and hope that judges, or in case our audience, have been persuaded. For example, if I personally was trying to persuade an audience that the game Fortnite was really, really bad, 
metaphorically, I would gather all the kids who spent their parents' credit card on V-Bucks together in one little pile, and I would suggest the solution to this problem, which would be uh, burning all of their gaming consoles. Okay, and now <laughs> to introduce the individual that has somehow been tasked with making all of us think exactly like her in less than 10 minutes, uh, you know, preferably without any type of mass hypnosis. I don't know if she can do that. That'd be kind of cool. Um, anyway, Tori Melendez is a communication studies major, which is incredibly, you know, kind of relevant that, you know, she ended up here with the communications department. Uh, so I think that's kind of fitting. So everybody, please welcome Tori Melendez. Sex work is on the fringe of society. Hardly a thought for most of us. But for many people, it is the reality. One woman, Brenda Myers Powell, has been raped, shot, and stabbed over the course of her lifetime. Her response to these attacks was that society had made it comfortable for her attackers to do so, and that she couldn't go to the police because they wouldn't take her seriously. And despite her horrific experiences, she shares that she feels lucky to even be alive. She is just one of many whose stories and lives are forgotten. The criminalization of prostitution and the failure by the government to regulate the trade only perpetuates violence against women. Prostitution needs to be legalized in California so that sex workers are not left vulnerable to disease as well as sexual and structural violence. Today, I will be talking about the health and physical dangers that sex workers face within the current system, how the system fails the most vulnerable people in our cities, and ultimately what actions we need to take to address the problem. <coughs> sex workers contract diseases more often due to having multiple partners and the inability to negotiate the use of condoms, which is detrimental to their health. According to AVER, a nonprofit dedicated to the prevention of HIV, sex workers are 13 times more likely to have HIV than the general population. Not only that, but according to the Center for Disease Control, female sex workers are two times more likely to have chlamydia and four times more likely to have gonorrhea. But despite the fact that they get diseases more often, they are often unable to get tested and treated for these very diseases. KT Wynn, a manager of a program for peer-to-peer -peer HIV prevention for sex workers, shares, to avoid arrests that can lead to violence, rape, and any, many other traumas, Sex workers try to avoid things that may identify them as sex workers, like carrying condoms or visiting health clinics for checkups. The fear, the stigma that sex workers face, as well as the fear of discrimination and of being prevented from accessing treatment, causes prostitutes not to get the help they need. Besides the biological threats that many prostitutes face, they are also victims of sexual and physical violence. According to Rain, one out of six women in their lifetime will be raped. But for prostitutes, that statistic more than quadruples. According to the Council for Prostitution Alternatives, prostitutes, 78% of prostitutes have been raped in their lifetime. Dr. Chesler, a professor of women's studies at the City University of New York, explains that prostituted women have long been considered fair game for sexual harassment, rape, gang rape, kinky sex, robbery, and beatings. But despite the rape epidemic that takes place within the sex worker community, these rapes are rarely ever reported. And if they are, they will never be investigated. This is partly because police participate in sexual violence themselves. According to the Urban Justice Center, 17% of sex workers in New York report being sexually harassed or abused by the police. 24% of sex workers in Chicago reported being sexually abused by the police. And in Ohio and New York, sex workers are not protected by rape shield laws. And the way many laws are written do not consider crimes against sex workers to be crimes. Besides the sexual violence, there are also victims to physical violence. It is estimated that there are 42 million prostitutes in the world, 80% of which are women. And more than half of them are predicted to experience some sort of physical violence this year. While prostitutes' main form of protection comes from their pimps, 85% of prostitutes report being emotionally and physically abused by them. Not only that, 
But prostitutes have been the targets of serial killers for years. The most recent example being the Green River Killer, who murdered 48 prostitutes in the early 2000s because he hates most prostitutes and they were easy to pick up without being noticed. Prostitutes lack protection, which makes them victims of endless violence. Clearly, there is such a threat to the lives and health of sex workers. So what must be done? We need to reform the system. First, we need to change the way we view sex workers so that they can be seen as more than second class citizens, but as people. They are just as human as a lawyer or a teacher or a doctor, and they deserve access to the same legal, health, and social services. Not only that, but penalizing, but, but penalizing prostitutes for prostitution only harms sex workers and human trafficking victims alike. Overall, the criminalization of prostitution has led to human rights violations across the board. They lack the protections that are guaranteed to every other citizen, which only leads to more violence, more disease, and more illegal activity. We need to change our views and recognize the injustices they face within the current system so that they can find safety in the very agencies that are created to protect them. One sex worker shared, the only thing the government has done for us is label us as prohibited. Forget having access to a better life. We have been denied even the most basic human rights. It's time for us to change that. Thank you, Tori, that was great. Sorry, I was on my smartphone checking Facebook, I mean, uh, learning in my library about a bunch of educational things. This, this is my library right here. It's uh, the uh, International Public Library now because I said so. All right, so for, um, for our final event of the night, we would like to come full circle and close with the same event we opened with. Marissa will be showing all of us her POI, which has earned her tremendous competitive success. We want you to join us in welcoming back Marissa McGettigan to perform her programmed oral interpretation. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. I roll the windows further down and let the cigarette smoke curl into crisp air, thinking about my ex, Jackson, what he might be doing in this moment. My muscles clenched at the thought. I need air, exit the vehicle, and <clears throat> try to dry heave that sick feeling, the restlessness. The summer after high school breakup, a coming of age tale that is fraught with pain and often results in mixed feelings for everyone involved. According to Psychology Today, processing a breakup can be traumatic. People often develop obsessive thoughts, constantly looking at pictures or videos of their ex. Unfortunately, rather than making them feel better, seeing images or thinking of old lovers stimulates the part of the brain associated with physical pain. It also causes activity in the part of the brain that deals with the reward and motivation. Specifically, it triggers a release of dopamine similar to that seen in drug addicts, leading people to crave their exes like addicts crave drugs. So although breakups before college are all too common, clearly these events can be seriously emotionally disturbing. With prose from Wenley Dickinson, poetry from Sarah Kay and Elizabeth Bishop, and drama from Steve Reiner and Jeffrey Tusick, a program, The Uncertainty of Direction. Abandoned buildings sleep off in the distance. This place where I used to spend every Friday I could, sitting on the hot asphalt, watching the kids skate by. 
I fall asleep to the sound of small plastic wheels rolling over rough pavement. The circular motion like goodbye, 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 over and over again. I wake up slowly, wishing I had another cigarette. My finger is now shaking. Nothing to ground them, nothing to touch. I flex them, curl them tight together. Think about how elegant things become hard, how our favorite foods eventually stale, how grasses shrivel to small, decaying mass. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster. Places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I remember last June when we were walking down the sidewalk in my hometown and saw that dog in the middle of the road. Jackson got down on his knees and held out his hand like he was holding out an offering. He used to hold his hand out like that to me too. The dog whimpered and sauntered back down the road. Jackson knelt on the pavement a moment longer than he needed to. I kind of miss school, you know. I mean, this will be the first time nobody's going to ask us to write a theme about how we spent our summer. I know, right? Hey, what are you doing next year anyways? I guess I'm going to San Antonio State. Yeah, is that, I mean, are you excited about that? Am I excited? I guess I'm kind of focusing on tomorrow and don't really want to think that far ahead, you know? Know what I mean? Yeah, so, hey, you know what's funny? When you're 16, they call it sweet 16. When you're 18, you get to drink, watch dirty movies, and vote. But what the hell do you do when you're 19? You leave home, I guess. My dad says Jesus never went more than 50 miles from his home. But look what happened to him, man. June heaved itself into July. Jackson is leaving in August. I know this to be true because we no longer watch movies or talk about teaching and the future. He would say, let's go for a walk. So we walked, but what to do with hands? He absentmindedly reached out for me, looped our arms together but the restlessness got the best of him. Let's go for a drive instead. The tan plastic interior of the car comforted us. His hands, built for this machine, for this movement. The uncertainty of direction the uncertainty of direction. The next morning, I woke up early. Jackson was lying on the floor, his hand curled around an old blanket. He was boyish looking in this moment, a cowlick on his head, eyes closed, socks, but no shoes. Desire for him pivots around this moment. Maybe I should have woken him, brought him back to his hard self. Maybe I could have run my fingers along the ridges of his back, understood the joints and parts which made him. But I didn't. September and he is already gone. Who knows what he is doing in this moment, what he was doing last night when the road turned to rivers from the thousand-year rain. 
Maybe his car hydroplaned down the highway. Maybe his tires found traction, scraped the grit on the road, his hand clamped on the steering wheel. I prayed he was not dead, prayed his body wasn't lost in debris. To write about you after you are gone is to shout at the rain, the mirror, the wood burning in the fireplace, knowing that no possible hindsight can heal what had to unravel, knowing that no possible warning could have prevented it, knowing that rain knows only how to hurl itself headlong to the pavement, knowing that a log already on fire splits itself open, offering more of itself to burn. Months pass and it's another New Year's Eve. Who knows where Jackson is when the ball drops? I purposefully do not watch it fall right at midnight. The motion makes me sick, though not as much as it used to. One day, our not love will be recognized for what it truly was. My fingers clasp the phone, thinking about how I want to call him just so we can talk, have an opportunity to make amends we will never make. I dial his number, hang up before the first ring. I always do, still afraid of his hands on the other end, picking up. So uh, that one passage in the last speech about that longing for an ex was really relatable to me. It explains why I keep having recurring dreams about Nick's mom all the time. <laughs> Epically owned. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, don't go just yet, because in just a second, uh, Hal's going to come up. He's going to tell, uh, tell you all how to get your extra credit, because I know that's what you all want. Um, don't worry. It will be explained simply to you. Just the last thing that I want to say while I'm up here is if you were at all interested in anything that you saw tonight, if this is something that appealed to you, please, I'm begging you, come find me, come find Ava, come find Hal if you're scared of either of us. Come find somebody sitting in these first two rows. Talk to someone. Uh, we'll be around for a while. Feel free to stick around. Come talk to us. We'll show you how you can get involved um, uh, and show you even some events that you actually didn't see tonight, some, some opportunities that you might be interested in. So I'm begging you, please come find us. We want to talk about this. This is what we dedicate absolutely ridiculous portions of our free time doing, um, debating, talking to crowds that aren't quite this interested. Um, so please, really, really do come talk to us. Thank you so much for coming tonight, you guys. really appreciate it. Um, we really, really do appreciate you coming out. You all know, I'm sure, from seeing placards and signs and reading in the press, this is the college's 100th anniversary. It's an amazing institution. Let's hear it for Santa Rosa. Yeah. This past October, we also celebrated the 50th annual SRJC Invitational Speech Tournament. That was pretty good of a milestone, too. How about that? Yeah. It's been an absolute joy of mine to have taught during a Actually, the last 25 years I've been teaching here. And a big, a big part of that for me has obviously been my involvement with speech and debate, and my involvement with Mark and Susan. 
Uh, it's truly a special, magical activity. I did it when I was in high school and college, and it is the single most, as many of you have heard me say, single most valuable educational experience I had in 20 years of education. I believe in it. I see the proof in my students' eyes and my students' uh, lives as they move forward, and it is truly an amazing, amazing adventure. I am sincerely grateful to Dr. Frank Chong and Dr. Jane Saldanatali and to Carrie Lowen and all the administrators, staff, people in facilities and accounting and elsewhere throughout the college that enable us to operate and expand educational opportunity for our students from year to year. So a round of applause to everybody that makes forensics possible. All right. If you go outside, you will see sheets of paper taped to the glass. Find your section identified by the teacher in time and class. Put your name on that, and I assure you it will be in their box within the next 24 hours. Thank you for supporting us. Have a great evening. Safe travels home. Bye-bye. <laughs>